Hi, Professor Wells here. So we are continuing our examination of the art history of the ancient world, and we've been looking at the Romans. Uh, we have examined some of the, exam uh, the examples of sculpture from the Roman Republican era, and now it's time to transition to the early empire era. And this is an era that really begins with one man, uh, his born name was Octavian, uh, but his uh, military success um, in regions that stretch to the east um, and the west, um, as well as to the south, to Egypt even, uh, when he defeated the famous uh, Cleopatra, the pharaoh of Egypt, and her lover, Mark Antony, um, really solidified his reputation in the eyes of the Roman Senate to such an extent that they gave him the title of Augustus, or the Exalted One. From that point forward, we're going to see um, Augustus um, start to centralize power. Uh, he is after control of more than one more than one thing. Um, and with that, his reputation and his long reign um, as emperor of, um, of the Romans um, would continue to see an era of expansion, but also tremendous um, artistic expression through sculpture, um, through architecture. Um, and this is why we know so much about his legacy. All right, though controversial, let's move on to our PowerPoints here, and I will show you what, probably the most famous sculpture of all of Augustus. Um, it's called Portrait of Augustus as General. Um, this um, is another example where the original likely was executed in bronze, but unfortunately we only have a copy of that statue. Uh, the date of it, 20 BCE. So um, on the left here is the sculpture to which I refer. And of course, on the right, I'll make myself disappear here, is the famous high classical Greek sculpture of the spear bearer by to make a comparison with. Uh, because as I've explained, the Romans had a deep fondness and appreciation for Greek art. And many of the naturalistic um, qualities um, of accuracy in um, anatomy and proportions, um, as well as that famous contrapposto stance here, that slight bend of the knee that gives a more naturalistic stance to the human body, less stiff and posed, right? That is something they adopt from the ancient Greeks. What you might notice that they don't adopt is the nudity. Um, when you look at male uh, Roman art um, and even describing the men, they're going to be clothed. And that was true in the depiction of this famous um, emperor of Rome. So Augustus, of course, um, was famous for not only his defeat of the mighty Egypt, but he won campaigns against uh, in, in Spain, in France, and against the Parthians in uh, present-day Middle East. In fact, on his military chess place, chess plate is a sculptural relief that delineates his victory um, um, against the Parthians. And so it is a billboard of sorts uh, showing the viewer um, an example of his success as a ruler. Um, other than that, he's wearing um, traditional um, skirted um, um, undergarment uh, associated with um, Roman attire. He has kind of a, uh, a swag of fabric wrapped around him, almost as if his toga that would adorn one shoulder has been removed and drapes around his left arm. Now, though the chest plate, of course, is a huge brag to his accomplishments, what we're not seeing are the other accoutrements associated with a warrior. Um, I'll come back to you now. What we're not seeing is like, a, you know, a weapon, um, a shield, a helmet on the head, um, those lace-up boots um, that was part of the typical military uniform for someone like Augustus. Well, no, because at this point he's becoming more politically active. 
And it was important for him uh, before he became a celebrated and appointed new ruler of the empire um, that he not be off-putting, be too much of a military man. And so that's why, though you see the chest plate, you see that he's barefooted, that communicates humility. Um, he has that finger raised in, with his index finger, a typical politician speech-making gesture or a gesture of leadership um, that we see to this day with our um, rulers and presidents and congressmen. Um, his hair, which previously had been quite bushy and large, has been trimmed more conservatively. That's something we also see with today's politicians, particularly the men. Um, and he carries a staff instead of a kind of threatening sword um, that a warrior would carry in those days as well. So what you find again is uh, incredible naturalism. Again, all of that is part of the Roman admiration of high classical Greek uh, perfection in the description of the human body, but they embrace the clothing and they also embrace the art of propaganda, of using art uh, to promote one po one's political aspirations and reputation, um, to promote ideas and concepts, um, to gain favor among their population. Now, another thing that he does is you might notice this little winged baby here. Now, that's not um, Cupid from traditional contemporary Valentine's Day interpretation, but Cupid's origins uh, take us back to um, the goddess Venus, known as Aphrodite to the Greeks, and of course the Romans adopt the Greek gods and rename them. So Venus to the Romans had a son by the name of Eros, and Eros um, is associated, of course, with Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, and so he too is associated with that in um, some contexts, but here um, he has been um, placed at the base of the statue to connect the idea in the minds of Romans that Augustus believed and promoted the concept that he was related to the goddess Venus herself. So he's claiming divine ancestry. We haven't heard that in a long time. That takes us back to Egypt, perhaps, where the pharaohs claimed that they were divine beings. Um, so to do that was a play on his part politically to solidify um, his right, his um, place as the emperor of the Romans. It's not unlike what Hatshepsut did back in New Kingdom Egypt, where she claimed that she was the daughter of their supreme god Amun-Re, right? And that brought her more time to be there for uh, first female pharaoh. So it's interesting um, how all of this is used um, to persuade and to solidify power when it really matters in an era where the empire is becoming increasingly powerful and increasingly sprawling, um, eventually reaching over three continents. All right. One more thing I want to show you as another way that there's a little close-up of that chest plate here that um, Augustus um, solidified his reputation was commissioning works um, of art and small um, examples of architecture, including an altar that was contained in this box-like building. Um, it's called the Altar of Augustan Peace because that is the one thing that he was recognized for. Uh, was the Arapacus, or this era of peace that he promoted, that he settled all the civil wars, he settled things down with the, you know, post-assassination of his uncle Julius Caesar. He's the one who brought peace to the Romans. And so he had this altar created, the Arapacus Auguste, or the, um, even much easier to say, Altar of Augustan Peace from the years 13 to 9 BCE. So let me come back to you here to talk about a couple of sculptural reliefs that you can find on it. So inside this room would be an altar, but what you find on it are a couple of examples of sculptural reliefs. And I think I have to pop away here for a minute. 
Um, but this one is one of the most well-preserved examples. It's um, a female personification um, on the east side of the altar. And um, what you find is, again, a personification is an idea or a concept in human form. So the whole thing is allegorical with a central figure who is a, a female type holding two babies. You also have more um, allegorical or fantastical female beings on either side here. Um, but though the jury's out, the fact that she's surrounded by children, by flora and fauna, you see plants and animals, um, it's the thought that perhaps she embodies uh, Mother Earth um, and the idea of fertility and bounty, the idea of Augustus bringing bounty and fertility to the Romans is what's suggested um, with this panel. So again, it's political, fundamentally, promoting his contributions as a ruler. Then the next piece is also very interesting because it's indirectly uh, self-congratulatory and connecting to another golden age. So um, this one, I'll pop out again, is called the Procession of the Imperial Family. Again, it's one of the sculptural reliefs you find now on the south side of the Altar of Augustine Peace. So this is another marble, and again, the whole thing was constructed of marble um, with this particular panels. Um, this one is um, showing a crowd and they think that there would be a festival or procession in honor of this era of Augustan peace um, on the date of July 4th, which is coincident coincidentally our Independence Day here in the United States. Um, but what you see is a variety of types, young and old, men and women gathered in period attire, um, um, clothed, of course, because we know that they do not embrace the heroic new type in ancient Rome, but individualized. Many of these faces have been identified, many have been lost to history, but we know from the Roman Republican era that the Romans were very, very adept at individual portraits back to you again here. But what's also interesting is the presence of children. That might have to do with the real problem um, of a low birth rate in the Roman Empire. At one point, I think they had more slaves in Rome than they had actual Romans. Um, so it's possible that it's a bit of a uh, promotion of, um, you know, of family values, of having children that even members of the imperial family are participating in that. Um, I just really enjoy the naturalism of it, the side conversations, the children tugging on parents' robes as they often do, lacking patience for the adults talking too much about stuff of no interest to children. So in many ways, it has this kind of naturalism that's continued part of the legacy of the ancient Greeks. In fact, doesn't it look a lot like what we've seen at the Parthenon? If we go back to the golden age of Greece in the, of the fifth century, um, doesn't it remind you a little bit of the ionic frieze that wraps the Parthenon, the iconic temple in Athens? Um, those scenes from the, another festival, the Panathenaic festival, where crowds of people are described in the most naturalistic way, you know, having side conversations, doing that iconic contrapostal stance. It's as if that is by intent. It's as if you have Augustus and his artisans making a direct connection between his rule, the era of Augustan peace, um, and the golden age of Pericles. All right. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a super day.